I'm going to be talking about the health data um, ecosystem in Canada and then about some very specific roles that HDR in Canada, Health Data Research Network Canada, is um, trying to play. Um, and I uh, should, I hope you'll forgive me. I try not to use acronyms, but I am probably going to refer to HDR in Canada just because it's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, so that's, can we move to, that, I think that's just a placeholder. So we can just move to my slide. So while the, the slides are coming up, I wanted to, um, thank you. I wanted to um, provide an, a sort, of, sort of an additional uh, introduction of myself um, to this uh, talk, because I think that, that the, the background um, really informs the way I think about all of these issues. So I'm um, originally from Michigan, um, as you can see, if you know that uh, we have a little saying in, in Michigan that we're smitten with the mitten. Um, so I, uh, I am the granddaughter of immigrants um, to the United States from Ireland and from what used to be the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I really don't know anything about my family prior to my grandparents' generation. I am the daughter of parents who were the first um, generation to finish high school, much less um, carry on for uh, post-secondary education. I am the daughter of a, a single mother. Um, and I grew up in Kalamazoo, which is a, a pretty small town on the west side of Michigan. Um, and it, it was, I was in my 20s before I, I was ever in a city of any particular size as Chicago and, and so on. 30 years ago, I was, um, had the great fortune of moving to British Columbia. And I have to do double advancing, okay. What did I do? I'm going backwards, everybody. Okay, now I know how to use slide advancers. Um, I had the great fortune of moving to British Columbia, um, which is uh, the, and particularly I live in East Vancouver, which is the traditional unceded ancestral territory of the um, Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Tooth Nations. I did my um, PhD at the University of British Columbia, which is on uh, Musqueam territory. Uh, I would acknowledge that UBC has a long way to go for um, to develop really strong relationships with the, um, the, the ancestral um, holders of that land. Um, and I would also say that I am the first person in my family and still the only person who has a PhD. Never thought I'd be an academic. Started my PhD in my 30s. I finished when I was just under 40 and here I am. Um, so, like I said, all of that informs the way I think about health data and our obligations around health data. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be able to have this um, discussion with you today, which I hope um, seeds a lot of other things, as, as Frank said, planting the seeds for further conversation. Um, this is what I'm going to be talking about today. I don't have any conflicts um, to declare. Um, we'll talk about health data in Canada, uh, a little bit about the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy, which is really um, helps to describe and inform the, the health data landscape as it is. I'm particularly going to focus on the health data charter, um, why we care about health data and health equity more particularly, and then talk about trust and public involvement, which then will be a bridge to the, the talk that Julia Burt will be leading later today. So what is the state of health data and health data systems in Canada? So this, this is just a, a little montage of uh, headlines that appeared um, during the first part of COVID when it became really, really clear that we had a big data problem. And I don't mean big data, I mean big comma data problem in Canada. Um, with lots of data that we needed in order to understand what was happening in the context of the pandemic that just were not available. Often they were not available because they did not exist, um, much less the, the politics of, of data sharing that I think we're all at least somewhat familiar with. Um, so it is in that context that the Public Health Agency of Canada um, decided that what we needed was to develop a pan-Canadian health data strategy. And one of the things that they did was they established an expert advisory group um, that would be um, that would provide some input into what that strategy might look like. That was created in December of 2020 and worked together until August of 2022. 
Um, like I said, this was an advisory group. We did not write the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy in any way, shape, or form, but I think we had some influence on the conversations um, that were happening behind the scenes and that have are leading to the to adoption of Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy. Um, there was a, a wide range of expertise on the members that were part of this group. I was very fortunate. I, I feel like it's one of the highlights of my career to have been included in that group. Um, and it was chaired very ably by Vivek Goel, who, um, for those who don't know who he is, uh, he's a public health physician who was at one time head of um, Public Health Ontario. He was vice president of research at the University of Toronto, and he's now president of Waterloo. So, and he is just a wonderful, um, wise person who was a, really an effective chair of this group of I don't know. I don't would like to think it wasn't quite exactly like herding cats, but I'm sure some days he felt like maybe that's what he was doing. So I'm not going to talk about all three reports of the expert advisory group, but I just want to point out that there were three reports that we put together, one talking about the health data foundations, um, one talking about, well, actually the first one, importantly, going back to say, why would this group and our recommendations be different from all the 60 years of reports that came before us? Um, and then thinking about the Health Data Foundations, and then I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the recommendations from the third report. All of these are uh, available publicly online. So before I get into the recommendations, this is one of the, the really big things that we talked about is this problem of, and I think this is, I call this like the pizza diagram, where we, we know that data are collected in the healthcare system, particularly at different points of care. So your primary care team or physician has data um, that they collect, the research system collects data, the acute care, long-term care, all of these things, but they're divided. And we'd like to think the person is at the center, but that's not really the case. It's just the case that all of these systems exist, they collect data, but there's locks and barriers in between them. They don't necessarily ultimately function as a system of health data at a higher level than those individual collection systems or pieces. And this is really one, like really the fundamental problem, one of them anyway. And, and what it leads to is this, um, where we hear people talk about binder medicine. And, and the idea here is because you know that the health data are not gonna follow you as you move through the system, it becomes somehow an individual's responsibility to keep all of their health records, to organize them in a binder um, to, and to trot them around as you go from place to place, to remind people about um, your history, to repeat your history over and over again. So this is, I, and I think this is, you know, a little bit um, already similar to things that Rachel was talking about of, you know, putting a lot of responsibility on individuals rather than the system to get things done the way they should be done. There's also an issue that this creates um, intricacies if you want to have access to data for research purposes or other things at a more aggregate level, where we're talking about research uses um, or uh, other management uses of data. They're not usually um, about a single person's journey. We wanna aggregate that information up. But those systems of, of access, and this is one of the things Health Data Research Network Canada is trying to address, but they're very circuitous or unclear, or worse yet, maybe sometimes there isn't even a pathway or we can't find it or we don't know what it is and we get stuck. So this is, this is a, one of the things that we really need to think about and solve in all of this is, what do we want health data to be when they grow up? How can they serve our purposes and what do we need to do to make the changes that are necessary? So this is where we want to get into the um, recommendations from the third report. And I'm gonna start with recommendation one, which is this future vision where everybody in health, um, it, by 2030, I mean, ideally we'd have it sooner than that, but by 2030, that everybody in Canada, uh, all people living here will benefit from a truly integrated health data system that's optimized and that is part of what we call learning health systems, which means that we're in a, a place of continuous improvement in health data use and ultimately in the provision of equitable um, health care services. And that these um, common principles are going to be um, um, kind of combined and re re replicated or reflected in a, a Canadian health data charter. 
So that's the first and most fundamental recommendation. Well, most fundamental with the next one. And the next one is that, um, that jurisdictions demonstrate that um, they have support for First Nations, Inuit and Métis Nation data sovereignty. Um, and that we have uh, understand that this is with a distinctions based approach and it, and it reflects uh, how we act across all jurisdictions. So these are the only two recommendations. The rest of the recommendations are really, um, they're, they're consistent with the health data charter. So with these two really um, focus pieces on the commitment to that, um, this, the, the health data system needs to be able to serve everybody and that we need to be supporting um, this distinctions based approach to indigenous led research and indigenous data sovereignty. I want to turn and talk a bit about the health data charter itself. So you might have seen on the previous slide, this was referred to as the Canadian health data charter. As we were writing this health data charter in the, in the expert advisory group, we realized that we should take the Canadian part out because we hope that these principles are something that any place around the world could adopt that they could be adopted within Canada by a number of organizations. And, and the idea here is um, that we are inspired by these um, approaches to human rights and um, non-discrimination and all of these other things, um, and that we want to improve data collection across health systems to inform future decisions. And that last quote is from a speech from the throne. The rest of it was our thinking that this is a if you think about that, a health data charter, if we write it as, as having a common set of principles, those become the guiding framework. If we all agree with them, we can, it's something we can refer back to and hold ourselves accountable to collectively as we try to work together on, on and actually getting uh, the health data system to change. So um, we also were mindful that we wanted to make this relatively short and succinct this is not detailed explanation of how we go about achieving all of these principles. Um, much more, we were aligning our thinking with the way that the Canada Health Act reads with very five basic fundamental principles. Um, but you see here, uh, to honor the duty to put persons and populations at the core of all decisions about the disclosure, access, and use of health data. The health data re um, charter requires 10, 10 principles, and I go through each one. So first and foremost, health data need to be person-centric. Um, they need to be changed from that pizza diagram to something that actually does put people in the center of our decisions about how we construct data, health data, how we use data, how they move, um, and so on. Secondly, that we have common standards for terminology, health data design, stewardship, interoperability, access, and portability. So the common standards just means that we actually agree that we're going to use the same kind of data collection um, when we mean, like say we were gonna uh, collect information on race or ethnicity, that we would try to have standards that say this is the appropriate, culturally sensitive, acceptable way to do this and that we do that consistently across the country in all health data systems. The next is that of course we want to make sure that we have quality, security, and privacy for all health data in all of their stages of um, collection, storage, and use. I mean, I, I think, I hope that this one's a, a given, but it's uh, obviously important to write down and make sure that we in, embed that as a, as a principle. The next is that we wanna make sure that there's timely accessibility for health data. And this is to individuals, as in everybody in this room should have access to their own person-centered organized health data um, that is available to decision makers, researchers, and the health workforce. And that that timely accessibility means the data are relatively timely as much as we, they can be, but also that our access to them does not go through that securitous process that I showed in that previous diagram, that we can make that timely as well. The next is that the use of health data for policies, programs, services, statistics, and research for the public good, um, given the importance of, of open science. So this, so the public good part is really important here. So we want to have a lot of different kinds of uses of health data because they can be used from everything from clinical care up to policy program planning and all of those other things. But we do need um, to have that 
public good principle as a, as a, at the center of these decision making. And that's not an easy thing to achieve. So again, this is why these are, are principles that we can then hold ourselves accountable to as we develop the, the ways that we might actually execute that at, in, in, real, in the real world. We do want to have data-driven social and technological innovation. Um, so this, the, the fact that things need to be in the public good doesn't mean that we want to rule out um, private sector access and other kinds of uses of data. Um, this, is, this is how we get um, innovations like new therapies, treatments for people who have rare diseases, all sorts of other things that we do actually value as a public. So this is not antithetical to the public good. It's that if the public good is there, we also want to be able to then within that context, figure out how to support innovation in a responsible and acceptable way. We do think that the health data literacy piece is really important. And I very much hasten to say this is not the public needs more health data literacy. Um, providers, researchers, policymakers, all of us could do with more health data literacy, probably different forms of it. But when we've had conversations about this, we've been talking even things about putting this into curriculum um, for young kids to think about you need media literacy, information literacy, data literacy, health data literacy, all of those things are um, helping people navigate the world we live in now. We definitely need to have harmonization of uh, health data governance, evaluation and policy. And, and this is not to dictate that everybody has to have exactly the same policy, exactly the same legislation that would be very, very tricky in the federation that we live in in Canada, but they can be harmonized. We can understand the commonalities and work through the commonalities to find ways to move forward. Once again, in the Health Data Charter, and we wanted to underline the importance imperative of, for support for First Nations, Inuit, and Métis um, data sovereignty. And um, wrapping it back around, the 10th principle of, uh, comes back to resonate with the first, which is that we need to have in, um, inclusion of diverse members of the public, um, patients, communities, and other stakeholders in health information system development and oversight. And that will come, I'll come back and talk a bit about that more later in the talk. I do wanna go back when I, when I talked about interoperability. Um, a lot of times um, people think about interoperability as being a technical exercise. And I would say that in our group, we talk just as much about the, the importance of human interoperability. That a lot of the ways that we're gonna be able to work this and, and execute the, a vision for a pan-Canadian health data strategy is gonna be by bringing groups together that are not used to working together and having a collective um, uh, impact and collective voice for how we can move to, uh, forward together on all of this. It's not gonna be driven from one organization or one viewpoint as we go forward. So, okay, so I've, I've talked all about the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy and, and what we're doing. So why do, we, why do we care about health data or health equity? I mean, I think the, the fact that we're, you're all in this um, room and online with us would signal that you probably have some belief yourself or understanding of why we care about, about health data. Uh, I am gonna talk a bit more about health equity, I'm, but I'm gonna pause here and just say a couple things about um, Health Data Research Network Canada, which is that we are a, a pan-Canadian network that includes member organizations from um, all provinces and um, two territories we're working on. And we are starting conversations with Nunavut as well and would like to bring them in. Um, we are working on partnerships with um, um, First Nations, Inuit and Métis organizations and communities. Uh, we are dedicated to making that circuitous process for data access more of a straight line and an understandable line for researchers in the country. Um, we have lots of tools and resources that are, are going to be available. We're thinking about more advanced ways of doing that. Um, but what I really wanna focus on today is the, the importance of equity and our principles of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, and how we think about everything within the network. Now I'm gonna say that um, uh, our commitment to um, indigenous data sovereignty is just as strong. It's just not the, the specific focus today, though, it will come um, through in a, a number of things that I'll say. So this is, this is, in my mind, is one of the reasons that we care about equity. 
So when we think about health care in particular and health services, we think about, you know, visits to the doctor, did you get your pharmaceutical, can you afford to pay for your pharmaceuticals, um, was your hospital stay effective, did you get treatment on time and all of those things, but this isn't really fundamentally, if you kind of draw back a little bit, this isn't what we care about in the end. Um, Wait, my big red circle is going to come up. That's not what we care about. This is what we care about. Um, this is my mom. <laughs> she has given me permission to use this. But the point here is, is that um, what we really want is health care that helps us be healthy. And the reason that we want health is because health is a resource for living. And, and now I'm going to think about my colleague, the um, former English teacher who probably really hates this, like what the heck is capabilities and functionings, Kim? That seems like a made up word. Uh, I didn't make it up. This is, um, this is the idea put forward by a philosopher and economist, Amartya Sen, who um, won a Nobel Prize. So I figure since he won a Nobel Prize, I'm allowed to, to use these words. But the idea here is that um, capabilities are the things that you might be able to do. And they are determined by the resources that you have available to you. So do you have um, money? Do you have food? Do you have, uh, do you have health? Because health, of course, is a pretty big determinant about the things that you might be willing to take on or that you might be able um, to see as a potential future for yourself. And then the functionings are then the things that you actually achieve the things you decide to pursue based on the capabilities that are presented to you. So you need resources, that leads to choices, and that leads to the, your ability um, to actually engage. And so the, the, the really important thing here is not all of us want the same thing. Not all of us need the same thing. Not all of us um, value um, the different uh, pieces of health. We might trade, we might say, I know that this, this thing I'm going to choose to do could be health limiting or life limiting, I choose to do that. And that's perfectly fine. This is part of what being patient and person centered is about, is allowing people to pursue the things that they value and that they wish to pursue. So to me, this is like a really foundational bit of, of what we're talking about. So let's just kind of make sure we have common understanding about health equity and so on. So this is a this is the, the picture of inequality. So you can see the inequality in a number of ways here. Um, this person on the left, there's a more of an abundance of apples on the tree on the left. They're gonna have more access to apples than the person on the right. But both of them are um, experiencing a bit of a problem because right now, this thing that they need from the tree, uh, let, and let's just think about this as being a, a a, a capability that do they have the capability to find good food to be able to eat to to make their choices in life clearly there's inequality here but if we gave them um, access both to a ladder to get up to the tree we might say oh, okay now you both have a ladder but is that really equality we still have a bit of a problem i think because the person on the left again has more apples on their side of the tree and the person on the right, frankly, can't even reach um, the, the leaves on the tree to begin with. So this is equality, but it falls far short of what I think we're really trying to achieve in the systems and services we're putting in place, which is equity. Now, this is equity, right? You have got two different ladders. One's a little bit taller. Both people can reach the tree, but it's still a problem, isn't it? So. We, we still have a tree that's loaded on one side more than another. We've had to give people different resources to reach the same thing and not even the same thing at that. So this, even though we might call this equity, it's still falling a bit short. And so what we might actually think of instead is justice. And justice, as you can see, now I'll go back here, oh, back here, what have we done? We've actually fixed the tree, we fixed the system. So instead of, and this is, I think this, I'm gonna resonate with what Rachel Plachinsky was talking about. Sometimes we seem to want to fix the people. If only you were taller, if only you had a ladder, if only you would do something different. 
And really what we need to do is actually fix the system. Now, the other thing you'll note here is somehow when we straighten the tree out, we also made more apples on it. So part of this is about straightening the tree so people have equal access, but the other part is about nurturing the system so it actually um, can provide something closer to what we might call justice. Now, I'm gonna say that I'm actually attracted to some other versions of this, which actually call this co-liberation. And the, the important distinction with that in my mind is that in that context, what we think, what we are understanding is that when you on the right have access to equal access, equitable access, justice-based access to the things you need to be able to pursue what you want in life, that's better for me too. And not just in an altruistic sense, but truly much better for me because that's the kind of society I wanna live in where everybody has equal uh, access. Not that we're all the same, not that we're homogenized, but that we all have the ability to pursue what we want. So this is the kind of basic thing about health inequality versus health equity. Health inequality um, is something that's different in health status. Um, and it might be something that it's, inequality could be something as much as like women leave, live longer than men. Um, so some of these things are not things we can, they're not necessarily inequitable. It's just that they're, we're different. We have different endowments, we have different capabilities, we have different interests, we are going to look different in the end. But that's really quite different from a health inequity, which we would identify as unfair or unjust. A difference that's created by systems, that it's avoidable, and it's something that we, um, and it's socially produced, and it's preventable, and it's something that we can then address. And then I would say once we understand that, then we have an obligation to address. Okay, so let's bring this back to the health data. I, ho I hope that, I, and I think that the important thing that I, I want to say in all of this is that data reflects our reality. If our tree is crooked, if our apples are loaded on one side of it, then the health data we're collecting reflects that bias. It reflects that systemic difference in things. Um, systems we understand have been oppressive. They have been racist. They have been um, unjust. They have been sexist. There's been many, many things wrong with our systems. Where there are system defects, our health data reflect that. So that's, so we start with systems of oppression and we end up with data that has bias in it. Now, I'm gonna be really quick to say, and this is, um, I'm gonna give credit to, um, Amy Fryer, who you'll hear from later today, and Alan Katz, who wrote um, a paper uh, in the Canadian um, Family Physician Journal ab about this. And there's a lot more to say on this as well. But this bias in the data we collect, if you talk to a lot of health researchers and big um, data, data intensive researchers right now, they will say, yeah, that's right. And we can adjust for that bias. We can remove the bias from the data and then we're good, we can carry on. And I would say, sure, you can do that. Um, and sometimes that's the, absolutely the appropriate thing to do, depending on your research question. But if we just scrub the data of bias, then what we're doing is further ignoring the systemic nature and the structural problems that produce the bias in the data to begin with. So we cannot look away from the fact, and sometimes we actually might, might want to analyze that bias in so that we can actually truly understand how the health system is working and not working, who it's working for, who it's not working for. And then we have the power to address that. So cautionary tale for health researchers, bias is not always your enemy. Bias can be your friend if we're actually interested in understanding that and addressing it. And of course, that's really, really important because if we don't understand that bias and deal with it in our analyses, then we're just going to continue to replicate things and we will do um, harm. And I, I hasten to say that inadvertent, unintentional, unknowing harm is still harm. And we have to uh, begin to understand that and, and take that on. 
so this is a this is a um, saying that that came out of the UK. Data saves lives. So we should all be interested in health data because health data is fundamental to moving the system forward, getting better services, improving innovation, all of those things. And data definitely can save lives for sure. Data can also do harm. Um, and, and we have to remember that. And if anybody's looking for some interesting reading, there's this um, really great little book called Raw Data is an Oxymoron. And it kind of just is, is a really, really nice way to say what I just said about the bias that's cooked into data. There's no such thing as raw data. Raw data is determined what we collect, how we collect it, what's included in those data systems is absolutely structured by power, power dynamics. Somebody is making decisions about what we care about and what we don't. And those are really, really important things to say, um, to keep in mind as we're doing things. And ideally to challenge, and that's the other book I would highly recommend, the State of Feminism book, which is really all about things like, make sure we analyze the power structures that are inherent in data. Then we start to challenge the power structures. Then we shouldn't be afraid of the emotion and showing data in visualizations and uh, graphs and charts and, and um, knowledge and mobilization activities that actually embody that emotion. Um, that we should be careful about hierarchies, that we should be mindful of the work that goes into data that's often invisible and often itself really problematic. One example of that, AI systems, artificial intelligence systems depend on um, data that are um, labeled. So how do we, we train AI systems by labeling pictures of cats and dogs so we know where the cats are and where the dogs are and what's not a cat, and what's a table and all those other things. That work is outsourced to lower income countries and is done by people um, at, at very, very low wages. And that's the invisibility of work that goes into the things. We need to be accountable for that. And, and that actually relates to this other strand of, of work um, on data justice, representing um, true experiences in data, being mindful of who is missing and why they're missing and, and how to rectify that. So this is something that um, our uh, idea in inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility community of practice led by Amy Fryer has been working on. Um, and these are questions that we've determined that we should be asking about diversity or about uh, these aspects of idea um, when we're thinking about meetings and so on. I wanna apply them to the data space. So for inclusion, has everyone's experience in health systems, in public health, actually been represented in the data that we're using. Diversity, who's in the data? Who's not in the data? Why are they missing? What's the, pro what's the thing that kept them out of the data? Equity, what are the barriers to people being able to enter the data? And this could be things like uh, my colleague, um, uh, Mailing Wiedemeyer calls, the hard work that people do to get to the primary care office in the first place. We think we have an accessible, um, equitable system for primary care because there's first dollar coverage in Canada. But if it's impossible to get an appointment, if the doctor doesn't speak your language, if the hours don't work because you have childcare, um, if there's not an interpreter, there's so many ways that you might be excluded from that. So who's not in the room? Who's not in the data? And accessibility, has everybody's uh, access needs been met? And, and again, who, who can access the services, who can access, and fundamentally then who can access the data and use it and understand it and challenge what's there and what's not. I wanna acknowledge as well that there's many, many, many other principles and practices we should be including when we're thinking about health data, health data use and so on. Um, this is work that, um, Jennifer Walker and others in the Global Indigenous Data Alliance have been working on where they have um, talked about the care principles, collect, um, where care is about collective benefit authority to control responsibility and ethics. And that's paired with these fair principles for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data. So great that we have this open science idea and the fair principles, but we have to make sure that we're pairing that with the ethical statements and, and practices behind that. Okay, so this is, I'm rolling into the last part of um, presentation here. So trust in public involvement. So 
maybe if you take nothing else from this last bit, I would say this is my, um, you can't pour, pull normative rabbits from positive hats kind of thing. So we, um, we if, if we're talking about health data in the health data space, these are very much values-based discussions, very much based on norms, um, which means that there's not a model that somebody can run. There's not an expertise at the policymaking level that's gonna tell us what we should do, how we should think about data, collection, storage, use, sharing, and so on. We need to actually think about the, the values we hold um, across the country in different communities and how we bring those together. So that is very much, again, not an, a, a question of expertise or a practice of expertise. It has to be a pra practice that involves voices that we don't necessarily always bring to the table. So, so if we think about, and this is where trust and all of these things come in, so trust is where you can rely on somebody. It's based on relationships and it's ongoing. Um, the, the phrase that I've heard used more and more is trust comes in on foot and leaves on horseback. So it's much easier to lose than it is to earn. And it's a responsibility to, to keep earning trust on a day, um, day in and day out basis. Dra data trust I might define more specifically as trust in how data are collected, protected, disclosed, and used. And this is the idea of social license, which Julia will pick up um, later in her presentation. And then data literacy, um, literally being able to read and write data. So our ability to understand what's going on with data. So I wanna just talk very briefly about um, public engagement and communication, which is really, I think, fundamentally part of how we build um, trust. So this is a, a framework that is used quite um, consistently with this idea that that you can in, um, involve or engage members of the public anywhere from the left-hand side of, I have a website, you can go there and get some information. We issue a press release, it's one-way push, doesn't really involve people at all, but it is a way to inform. And all the way to the other end where we actually give people the right to make decisions. And then everywhere in between where we might um, consult, we might, um, have a conversation, involve people in some decision-making. So this is, there's a spectrum here from, from everything from just a, you get some information to we're actually handing over the reins of power. Um, so when is, when is it, when do we wanna use this and how do we use this kind of thing? So I, I'm gonna say that essential transparency means we should always be doing things at the lower end of the spectrum. We should always be informing. And I think this again is consistent with, Rachel, with, with what Rachel was talking about. And then I think we need to be careful. We can pick horses for courses. So the, the idea that depending on what you're trying to do, you might have a, a higher level of, of involvement. I, what I don't want to pretend is that it's always necessary to be on the very right-hand side. There are cases where we want to be there, but it's, it's got to be choice of kind of involvement or engagement depending on what your uh, intent is. And we do need deeper involvement in some cases. And I think that the health data and the use and collection of health data absolutely falls <laughs> at the right hand of that spectrum. Um, as I said, these are multiple choices with multiple trade-offs and they are normative or values-based. So when should we not pursue public engagement? If you've already made a decision, please don't do public engagement. It's not respectful. It's not a good use piece of uh, people's time. If it's required, but you're not actually interested, but you get to tick the box, again, not respectful, not a good piece, uh, use of people's time. Or if you're just trying to delay, you're gonna make a decision, you kind of know what the decision is, but it's not gonna come for six months, so we'll do some engagement, just kind of assuage things. So you, you can see that I, I really believe strongly in public involvement engagement, but there are times when it, when it really shouldn't be done. This can't be done as window dressing, it's gotta be do, done with true commitment. So this is my last slide. Um, I think that there's a lot of ways that we, we can fix the system. And, and this again is this is we need to focus on not trying to change individuals and individual choices and behaviors. We need to fix the systems that serve all of us as um, community members uh, across Canada. Um, health data absolutely need to be better. There's a lot that we need to do and we need to get going on it sooner than later because it's failing people now. The Health Data Charter, I hope, offers some really great starting principles. I really believe um, that a principles-based approach to initial conversations is the way that we can keep ourselves honest and keep large groups of disparate people together in the conversation, which is what we need in the end. 
The principles of equity and more broadly idea, the inclusion, di diversity, equity, and accessibility are fundamental to decisions about data collection, sharing, and use. And that's because it kind of relates to all of those other things about power. What do we know from data? What can we know from data? How do we pair quantitative data with qualitative data as Rachel Plachinsky was talking about and so on? Um, we need absolutely to support distinctions based indigenous led research and indigenous data sovereignty. And this is part of reconciliation. I've made a personal commitment to, to reconciliation, um, to improving my own understanding of how what I have learned needs to be unlearned so that I can make sure not to impose um, my thoughts and ideas uh, or to misunderstand um, other cultures and ways in, of thinking. Um, and I think that needs to be true for all of us or we're, or we're not gonna actually move forward in that space. And then finally, that the collection sharing and use of data are normative values-based decisions and therefore require public input in an ongoing way, way and real power for the public um, to influence. And I'll close by saying, I do not mean that all of us should have individual control over all of our health data use over all time, because I can guarantee that 98% of the country is not interested in that. I think what I'm hoping I'm showing is that data themselves are very relational and that, that we need to embed that relational knowledge and relational practice in the way we think about health data and health data systems um, in the years to come. And with that, I will stop and we'll have time for questions. Thank you.